All right, so last time we started section 11.1, we're looking at vectors in space. As you recall, vectors have direction and magnitude. Um, and any vector that's in the same direction and is the same magnitude is considered to be the same vector. Um, and when we add and subtract and things like that, what we're really doing is we're recentering things back at the origin. So that's what that looks like. And we were in the middle of this example right here where we had been asked to compute a few things and then we were asked to show some illustrations of a few things. So the illustration right here that we had done last time, to remind you, was a plus b. And so we drew the vector a. And then from the end of the vector a, we drew the vector b. And this resultant vector that's in kind of this off color, it's a pink on my screen. It's hard to see it on yours. But this pink color is actually the resulting vector that is the summation of the two. OK? All right, so we're going to do the same sort of thing, but we're going to do this with subtraction. It starts with a. And so I'm going to draw vector a, the same that we drew before. So we will draw in vector, um, let's see, what was it? 2, 4. Um, it doesn't bother me, uh, WebAssign, if it's going to do something that's probably yeah. not going to tolerate it, um, yeah. but that would be fine. If okay. I, as long as I know what you're referring to, I'm good with that. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, so here's my vector A. And so I'm supposed to be doing vector B, but I'm supposed to be doing the opposite of vector B. So what would the opposite of vector B look like? Well, vector B says it's supposed to go 3 in the x direction and negative 1 in the y direction. So what are we going to do in, instead? Yeah, we're going to go 3, negative, right? We're going to go th negative 3, and then we're going to go positive 1. So from the end of this one, we're going to go negative 3. So 3 left, and then up 1, which puts us about right here. And if we draw this in, it would be like that. And so our resulting vector from our diagram is what vector? From the diagram, can we tell what vector this should be? Where did we end? Like, what's the ordered pair? Uh, we ended up at negative 1 and positive 5. And take a look back at the individual values. If we did this, would we, like, with just the numbers, would, would, we res would the result be the same? Yeah, so if we did 2 minus 3, we get the negative 1. And if we do 4 minus negative 1, we get 5. So this is the diagram that shows that. Sound good? Okay, let's keep going then. <coughs> Theorem 1.1 has um, a bit for you to write in. These are some properties of vectors. And a lot of the properties of vectors mirror properties of real numbers because vectors in some way involve the real number system in component form. So the first one talks about the fact that a vector addition is commutative. Right, so a plus b is b plus a. That's a commutative property. Um, it's also associative. So if we take the vector a and we add it to the summation of b plus c, it's the same as adding the two vectors a and b together first and then adding c on second. So we have an associative property. Uh, there is an additive identity. It's zero, right? This is the additive identity. It's the zero vector. What do you suppose the zero vector looks like? Like in ordered pair notation, what's it going to look like? Zero, zero, right? Just like you would expect it to. No news, no interesting information, to be honest. Um, number four, the additive inverse is going to exist. So if you have a vector a that's 5, 7, then the additive inverse for that would be negative 5, negative 7. So there is an additive inverse for every vector. The distributive factor hold, distributive property holds, but I want you to notice what happens with the way that this is set up. What is D out here? You can, it's a number, right? D is a number, it's a scalar multiple. It doesn't have the vector hat on it, right? And if you look back up in sort of the direction set at the top, it identifies that as well, right? It says that D is a scalar. 
So we have the ability to cross over the addition of vectors with a scalar. And we also have the ability to cross over scalars with a vector, right? That's the second one. And it doesn't matter whether the vector's in front or the scalars are behind. I mean, you can switch all of that around. That's, that's irrelevant because we have this commutative thing that we've got going on, so that's fine. Um, but we can distribute through scalars. We can dis distribute scalars through vectors and we can distribute a vector through two scalars. Um, the two at the bottom are the multiplicative identity and the zero property. So multiplicative identity, so this is again a scalar of one, right? So if you multiply one by anything, it doesn't change it. And then if you multiply zero through a vector, right? The zero is a scalar, and then we go through the vector, you're going to get the zero vector. So this zero on the left is a scalar, this zero on the right is a vector. Everybody good with that? Because it's being multiplied by a vector. All right, so we're going to do um, some examples, some more examples of these like we did last time. Um, and we've actually already looked at how we go about finding magnitude, but the part B here is something a little bit different. It wants us to find a unit vector in the direction of the vector we're given. Okay, so starting with, we're going to do the magnitude. So do you remember how we did magnitude last time? Yes. So the magnitude of vector v is going to be the square root of the individual components being squared. All right, so what is 2 squared plus 4 squared? Square root of 20, very good. And then if we can, and we can here, we will simplify square root of 20. How will square root of 20 simplify? 2 square root of 5. Okay, that's the magnitude. Okay, so we've already done that. But part B is the new part that's building upon the magnitude. We want to have a unit vector. So we didn't exactly write down a definition of this is what a unit vector is, but what is it? What do you suppose? Well, it's a vector. What is the of one. of magnitude one, right? It's supposed to have magnitude one. If it's a unit vector, it's one long. Mm -hmm. Okay, this vector is not one long. It's two square root of five long. Correct. So, any idea how we could change this vector into a vector of length one? You got it. Very good, Preston. If we take our vector and we divide it by its magnitude, we will get a vector of length 1. So we're going to take our, I'm going to drop that to the side for us. So for a unit vector, we will take our vector and divide it by its own magnitude. So our vector is, um, I'm going to write it in component form like this this time. You can leave it written the other way if you want. And we're going to divide it by 2 square root of 5. Um, that means we're going to divide each of the components, though, right? I mean, this is a scalar multiple now, right? It's just that it's in the denominator. That's fine. So this ends up giving me 2 over 2 square root of 5 and 4 over 2 square root of 5. And we are going to simplify and rationalize the denominator if those things are necessary. So simplification is necessary on both pieces. We notice that each, in each case, we have the ability to cancel out that denominator part that's 2, right? So this 2 will become a 1, and over here, this two, 4 will become a 2. Um, and then that leaves me with 1 over square root of 5. Do you remember how to rationalize denominators? Probably spent a fair bit of time in a trig class doing it. Yeah, multiply the top and the bottom by square root of 5. So I'm going to shift this over. I'll show it for this step. So we have on top square root of 5, and then what's the square root of 5 times the square root of 5? Five? 5, which is what we knew we were going to get, which is why we did it. And in the second one, we have 2 square root of 5 over 5. So this is our unit vector. How could we actually verify that it really is a unit vector? What could we do? We're not going to do it, but what could we do? Um, you might be able to graph it to have an idea of if it seems reasonable. What does it mean to be a unit vector? 
it's a vector of length one. How could I check to make sure that this vector has length one? You could find its magnitude. Right, we could find the magnitude of this. We could square this piece, and we can square this piece, and we can add them together and take the square root. In essence, we could do the same thing we did on part A, just with this one down here, right? And we could notice, and if we made a mistake or something like that, we could verify that it really has length of one. So what if we want, instead of finding a vector with length one, we want a vector with some other specified length? So here, we want our vector to have length five, okay? So we don't want it to have length one, we want it to have length five. Any thoughts? What if I told you I want this vector right here, which I think is a different one than we start than we have here, yeah it is. What if I wanted this vector to have length five? I mean, I found down here a way for it to have length one. What would I have to do for it to now have length five? Multiply everything by five, exactly. If it's got length one and I multiply everything by five, well then now it's going to have length five. Does that make sense? So everything we just did on this problem, we're going to do on the next problem as well with one additional step where we, like Dylan said, multiply by five. Does that make sense? Okay, so step one is that we need to find the magnitude of u. All right, so u is three squared and one squared. What's that gonna give me? Square root of 10, right? Everybody good with that? Okay, so step two is that we're going to take the unit vector, I'm sorry, take the vector and make it a unit vector. I just wrote that down wrong, I'm sorry. Take the vector and make it a unit vector. Here we go, by dividing by the magnitude. So we're going to take three, one, and divide it by the magnitude. And I'm going to end up getting three over square root of 10 and one over square root of 10, which I'm not going to leave like that because we have irrational numbers on bottom. So what will this be if I rationalize the denominator? Mm-hmm, three square root of 10 over 10, and square root of 10 over 10. Okay, and what will I do then? What, what did we say we're gonna do to make it length five? We're gonna multiply it by five. So I'll just write down the extra piece of what we're doing here. So we've got the five, that's the scalar multiple through here. And what will I do? Well, yeah, multiply to each individual component, which will actually just make the denominator smaller, right? Because it'll simplify. Um, so if I reduce as I go, I will end up getting three square root 10 over two and square root 10 over two. How could I verify that this really has length of five? Same as before. Hmm? Same as before. Same as before. We can just find its magnitude, right? We could square this first piece, we could square the second piece, add them together and take their square root. Now, keep in mind, this isn't the only way we can write these, so let me write them a different way too, just to remind you, because we haven't talked about it again today. I could also write this as three square root 10 over 10 i plus square root 10 over 10 j, right? We have this i j notation that we can use as well. Okay, so your book will use it, your web assign will use it interchangeably. You can pick which one you want and always use one, but sometimes web assign is going to probably force you to do one or the other. Okay, any questions? Okay, one more. We're going to find the vector with the given magnitude and an angle um, at this angle with a positive x-axis. So, okay, so I'd like to draw a picture of what this is describing to sort of develop the idea of what's going on, and we'll do a hearkening back a little bit into a little bit of a trig um, scenario so you can see what's happening. 
okay? So what does an angle of pi over 3 look like? You guys know. What quadrant are we going to be in? We're going to be in quadrant 1. It's the equivalent of what angle degrees in degrees? 60 degree angle. Okay, so let's draw a picture of that. So our picture looks something like this. And here is my pi over 3. Everybody good so far? Okay. Um, it says that it needs to have length 2. So well, let's just stop it right here. So it's, well, actually, I'll just put it right here. There you go. This has length 2. Agreed? I mean, that's, that's what it says. This vector is a vector of length 2. Do you see a triangle here? hope so. I'm going to draw it in if you don't. Um, the triangle that you hopefully are seeing here looks something like this. And this is a very familiar angle. Now, even if it's not familiar, we can do some trig to find the angle measure, but this, you know, to find the trig values and so forth. But this is a familiar angle. 30, 60, 90 triangles are those special triangle cases, right? Um, I have about three more class periods, I think, and my, my trig class is going to be learning about special triangles. Maybe it's sooner than that. But the 30, 60, 90 and the 45, 45, 90, those are the special trig angles. Do you remember how we do the side lengths and, and or do you remember the unit circle at the pi over 3 values that we could use? Let's go with unit circle. That's been more recent because trig we actually talk, or calc 1, we actually talk about unit circle. So in the unit circle, let's write it like here. What is the ordered pair at pi over 3? Okay, it's a square root of 3 over 2 and a 1 half. Which one's first? Hmm? It's the 1 half on this one. The 1 half is the first, and the square root of 3 over 2 is second. Um, so it's going to be one of those two. Um, if you compare this, I'll in, give you a, get a, an idea of how I think about it to remember. So here's pi over 6, roughly. Okay? So right over here, the x value is bigger than the y. And on our angle, the y value is bigger than the x. So that's how I remember the order of them in terms of those pictures. Um, so one half and square root of three over two, okay? So this one asks us to find a vector with the given magnitude. We figured out where it ended, right, in terms of space. It ends, right, that, that ordered pair where this, this description ends is actually going to give us the length we need. It doesn't have magnitude two yet, though, right? This is coming from the unit circle. So what is the magnitude right now if I just write down that I have a vector, which there is a vector, and it's 1 half square root 3 over 2. What is the magnitude of this? It's 1 because it's on the unit circle, right? How do I get it to have magnitude 2? I multiply it by 2. So if I multiply this by 2, I have 1 and I have square root of 3. And you might actually remember, thinking back to triangles for a moment, when you were working with it before unit circle stuff, there was um, a triangle uh, ordered pair. This is where, my, where I will start when I talk about it in trig. And this is my pi over 3. And we actually write this down as 1 square root of 3, 2. Do you remember that? So this is the image we have if we don't think of it on a unit circle. And this is the image multiplied by 2 if we think about it on the unit circle. OK. I don't think that's too bad. Um, that's great when it's a unit circle value. What would I do if it didn't have, a, not a unit circle value, but a nice trig value, like pi over 3? Pi over 3 is beautiful. What if it said pi over 5? What in the world would you do to find that location? You can still do it on a unit circle, but what would you do to find it instead? You could just use the Pythagorean theorem with uh, using either cosine or sine, mm -hmm. whatever the... Yeah. So, so Katoa... Yeah. Right? You can use Sokotoa. So think about it in terms of trig values. You can do it from that perspective. It's not quite as beautiful because it doesn't have, you know, the, the repetitiveness of the other things, but it still works. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. 